Yeah, somebody, somebody, left, somebody left a comment on the YouTube channel. They're like, this class, four hours once a week? I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry. tell me about it. Like, <laughs> yes. Uh, it is um, not ideal. <laughs> so one thing I should mention before we erase all this is, of course, um, in inner, inner product space and um, normal linear space, there are also metric spaces because you can define the distance function using the norm, right? The distance between P to Q is the, you know, the norm of the vector q minus p. And since we can define a norm with an inner product, that gives us distance in inner product spaces too. Um, which means, incidentally, that you can talk about open ball in either one of those two cases too. You can still talk about open ball in a inner product space or a norm linear space. And you can still use that to define what we mean by open set. So you can talk about like an open set of matrices if you want for a closed set of matrices. That has a technical and specific meaning. And um, furthermore, one of the interesting things is the sets in R2, which are open with respect to the Euclidean notion of distance, they're also open with respect to any of these other ones. Like what is open and what is closed, it doesn't care about our choice of distance function. The notion of open and closed is, is, is not as rigid as the notion of distance in some sense. Because if I can draw a little circle around, I mean, if you were looking at the corresponding things like a rectangle, a diamond, if you take an open diamond, can you pick another little open diamond inside that open diamond, which is inside there? I mean, you can play this nesting game like Russian dolls or whatever, with whatever one of these shapes that you want to play with. The place where these sorts of questions are really hashed out properly is a subject called topology. And topology is, yeah, topology or topology or anyway, yeah. Um, it's the study of which, which what, what does it mean to say open set? Or you could say topology is the abstract study of continuity. Or you could say topology is abstract analysis. That wouldn't be wrong. Um, Topology is a pretty recent branch of mathematics. It's really only come into its own since about 1920. <clears throat> All right. So that brings us to uh, section 2.2. So now um, we're, we're so we're, the, if you hadn't figured out yet, the last about 30 minutes of class or so, it's, it's a lot of sort of um, general terminology. And um, I just think these are things every math major should hear. And so now you've heard them. What you do with them, well, that's your business, I suppose. I, I don't know if I really have any homework on what we just did, homework in frames and three dimensions. I mean, most of the homework I can think of, um, you don't want to do because it would be kind of beside the point in here. Uh, but if I can think of one, I'll give you one, maybe um, if I can think of an elementary one. So um, what I want to describe now is how we give a inner product space structure to the tangent space to P and Rn. And I think I've actually already talked about this a little bit, but let me, um, not, not in Rn though, actually, this is for TPR3. So let P be an R3, and um, for the moment we'll use PV and PW tangent vectors to P. Then um, P comma V dot P comma W is guess what? V dot W. And um, P comma V uh, cross P comma W is P comma V cross W. So 
So this is the, the dot product and the cross product on the tangent space to R3. I'm really not telling you anything new. This is just what you already did in Calculus 3 in our current notation. Um, well, one of our current notations. Right? So what I, what I next do is just try to give you some like nice formulas for this. So if, um, let me translate these into our other, in other words, in other symbols. What does this look like in the, the derivative notation? Like, so we'd have, um, you know, V would be the sum, V upper I partial partial X I T, right? And what's W? Sum of W upper, let's say J of um, partial partial X J at the point P. And so V cross W would be equal to what? Well, here's a formula for it. It's the sum over I J K of epsilon I J K uh, V upper I W upper J partial partial X K at the point P. So this is a sneaky formula for the cross product. It's like really nice and compact. And this, this is the so-called Levi-Civita symbol. In particular, um, epsilon 1, 2, 3 equals epsilon 2, 3, 1 equals epsilon 3, 1, 2 equals 1, whereas epsilon 3, 2, 1 equals epsilon 2, 1, 3 equals epsilon 1, 3, 2 equals minus 1. And otherwise, epsilon is 0. So that's just a, a very concise way of capturing the six non-zero terms in the cross product, right? The same six non-zero terms you've seen in your homework problem this week with the wedge product of omega A and omega B, right? Like one, two, three, the two, one, three, the one, three, two, the one, two, three, I mean, so forth. So there you go, that's like a stone cold formula for the cross product in the, in the differential notation. Um, the dot product is easier. It's just the sum over I of V upper I, W upper I. That's, that's the dot product. All right. And um, so I prove in the notes, here's a fact you can prove. I give you an argument for it, but the norm of um, V cross W squared, it works out to the dot product of V and V times the dot product of W and W minus the dot product of V and W squared. This is sometimes called Lagrange's identity, if I recall correctly. This is not an easy thing to prove. The fact that I have it proved in about like four lines in my notes is just me bragging on the tensor notation. Like if you work it out by hand, it's like a page. So. You should appreciate on page 27 that I have a proof which is like two lines long. Or not, it's up to you. But um, <clears throat> anyway, this is a, an identity which is true for, the, um, true for the cross product. And of course, the same is true for the um, tangent space um, vectors to R3, right? Whatever the, whatever the formalism you use, this is still a formula, an identity which is true 
between the cross product and the dot products, whether you're looking at them as concrete vectors or you're looking at them, you know, as a sum of differential operators. Because the cross product and the dot, dot product, they're not really differentiating. They're not doing any kind of differentiation, right? It's completely an algebra game with the coefficients. Okay, so um, now what? So continuing. So I'm basically just going through and, and defining the norm for this particular example because this is the example we're going to be focused on for some time in here, R3 definition. Um, what's the length of the vector PV? It's just the length of the vector V, which is, of course, the square root of V dot V, which is, of course, <laughs> this litany of unnecessary duplicate, <laughs> duplicate comments here. So this is kind of annoying. With my V up, I have to do parentheses like this, right? <clears throat> so for the usual reasons, We have the norm of V plus W is less than or equal to the norm of V plus the norm of W, right? Triangle inequality. And well, here's something I haven't mentioned yet today, but we also have something called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which is the following. The absolute value of the dot product of V and W is less than or equal to the product of the lengths. So that is the so-called Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. I'm probably misspelling it, but anyway. If you're interested in proofs of these, ask me after class sometime. I have proofs in my notes somewhere, all right? I think I have not put them in your current set of notes because I think it's a little bit of a digression <laughs> to prove that here. What's definitely not a digression, though, is to point out that this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is mission critical for us defining angle between vectors. This Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is what makes angles between vectors a reasonable thing to define. See, because what this says is that the, um, you know, the absolute value of V dot W divided by the length of V times the length of W is less than or equal to 1. And what that, yeah, what, what does that mean? That means that we can identify that ratio as the cosine of some angle. So this implies that there exists a theta such that cosine of theta equals V dot W. Now there's one big old huge assumption I'm making here about V and W that we absolutely need for everything I'm saying to make any kind of sense, which is what? What's the angle between the vector that points at uh, Audric and the zero vector? The zero vector. I say it's 180 degrees. But, but you, say anything, you say anything you want to, right? We don't define angle with respect to the zero vector. It's very much related to the thing we were talking about earlier. <laughs> um, so we do need V and W both non-zero. Non-zero vectors we define the angle between. And, um, and there it is. So um, but it turns out you also have like Cauchy-Schwarz inequality over in these other more abstract contexts. You can define the angle between matrices if you want, for example. All right, I'm trying to stick with the R3. <laughs> so let me stick on my, stick to, stick, stick to what I'm supposed to here. So what happens with this, this over here? If this is true, what can you tell me about what's V dot W equal to? And this is the formula, formula we use all the time in Calculus 3, right? This is, a, this, is, this is bread and butter right here. This is like half of test one. 
right? Find the angle between vectors using that formula. But we could also take that formula and plug it into Lagrange's identity and see what that does. What does it do? So we've got, what, what's this? This is really length of v squared, length of w squared, right? Do you see that? The dot product of the vector with itself, this is, this is straight up norm v squared. This is norm w squared. And then v dot w squared, well that's minus norm v, norm w, cosine theta, quantity squared. So what happens? You got norm v squared, norm w squared, 1 minus cosine squared theta, also known as sine squared theta, right? So you got norm v, norm w, sine theta, sine squared, sine theta, sine theta squared. Because I can, I have the product of three squares, I can write it as the square of the product of three. A squared, B squared, C squared is ABC squared. Sure. One minus cosine squared is sine squared theta. was here to start with. I factored. Why would it give me a, no, I mean, if I multiply this out, if I complete the square, I mean, complete the square, not really what I want to say, but <laughs> squared, 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 here. Then all I'm doing is factoring this guy out. Okay. And that there's a, one here, if you look really hard. There it is. It's easier to see now. But, yep. And then uh, if I take the square root of that equation, what does it give me? Right, which of course is a formula. Now, do I need absolute value sine theta there? What do I see? It depends on how we define theta, I guess. But it is our custom to say that um, zero is less than or equal to theta, less than or equal to pi, right? And with respect to that choice of theta, what do you know about sine? What sine look like? I mean, cosine starts out at 1, and it goes down to minus 1, right? Which is good, because you want to have parallel kind of vectors and anti-parallel kind of vectors for negative cosine, you know? But the sine just does that. So sine is non-negative for the theta that we define for angles between vectors, which is why this formula doesn't need a plus minus, it's just that. And it better be positive or zero because otherwise we're talking about the norm of a vector. If the norm of a vector was negative, mm, that would not be good. Right. And then of course, you know this, this is the area of a parallelogram, right? <coughs> All right, I, I should stop, I should stop deriving stuff in Calc 3 and move along here, yeah? The, the better question though to ask is, just because it's algebraically permissible to define theta like this, how do you know geometrically that that really is the angle that you know and love from trigonometry and planar geometry? Can you prove that that algebraically motivated, analytically motivated cosine theta is the same theta that you know from geometry? Have you done it? It's about to erase with this worthless piece of garbage. What's wrong with me?
I have an argument in my Calculus 3 notes that attempts to do that. What I do is I look at a plane, and um, I set up a system of coordinates in the plane and look at a triangle where I can define the angle in the triangle. And then I set up vectors to calculate the dot product like this. And I show that the angle defined geometrically is equal to the angle defined analytically. Because the formula for A dot B, the formula for V, you know, the thing that we forget about this is like, you got to have, you got to have appreciate, you got to have, you got to have respect for this formula. I mean, look, look at this. This is, this is a really, really weird formula. And I think we get so used to it, we become familiar with it, and, and we forget how precious and beautiful this formula is. This is products of x, x with x, y with y, z with z components for a vector. Why should that be the product of lengths and a cosine of an angle? It's really weird. It's not a small theorem. And in fact, logically, I think it's essentially equivalent to the law of cosines for a triangle, because that's what I had to do used in order to prove that the algebraically defined angle and the geometrically defined angle are equal. <sighs> but no one in their right mind would do that in Calc 3. So you, might ask, you might ask the question, why did you put it in your Calc 3 notes? That's a good question. I think it's because I had to too much time on my hands. That's not really true either, though. I don't know why I did it. <clears throat> I guess it's because I was curious. All right, so um, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever had this feeling or not. Sometimes you become aware of something you've been assuming your whole life, and you just you need you feel driven to try to explain why those two things are the same. Like you've been assuming they're the same, right? But how do you really know they're the same? And that was that kind of question for me. Okay, so. Um, The, the direction of the cross product, of course, is given by the right-hand rule. Is that, oh, did it? Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate that. Bonus point. Bonus point? Sure. <laughs> You'll have to remind me. <clears throat> okay, so um, next up, I define orthogonal vectors. What does it mean for vectors to be orthogonal? Are perpendicular or orthogonal? Um, if and only if v dot w equal to zero. All right. Um, furthermore, <clears throat> we say, that was supposed to be say, kind of a say, eh. S <clears throat> equal to, let's see here, P comma V I, I equals to one, two, whatever say k of them, is orthogonal set if vi dot vj is equal to zero for i not equal to j. In other words, a set of vectors is said to be an orthogonal set if any pair of the vectors in the set are themselves orthogonal. If S is orthogonal set of vectors such that um, V in S, well, excuse me, P comma V in S has length of V equal to one for all V, you know, for all PV and S, then PV and S, what's wrong with me? Oh, yes, it's fine. Um, then <clears throat> S is so called orthonormal. 
orthonormal set of vectors. MTP R3. Now, I'm, I've made this definition for TP R3, but honestly, folks, you could easily give the same definition for an inner product space. Like all you have to do is replace dot products with inner product, and instead of saying TPR3, just pick your favorite vector space. Same definition holds. So I'm, I'm probably not going to redefine orthogonal later if we start working in like a four-dimensional context or something. I'll just kind of, we'll just think about generalizing this definition when we get there, if, if we ever get there. But this will, this will suit our purposes for now. All right. Now, so, definition, um, if we have beta equal to, let's say, um, PV1, PV2, PV3, man, I'm really getting tired of this notation. Um, so that's a subset of TPR3. Um, and beta is orthonormal, then beta is orthonormal basis. Or if you want to, you could just say a orthonormal basis is a basis which is also orthonormal. Orthonormal bases are really nice um, because if you can build vectors from an orthonormal basis, um, you can find components really, really simply. So, um, so for example, if I have vector v equal to, um, let's say, a u1, plus B U2 plus C U3. And um, so I'm going to start, because I, I, felt, I feel like you're getting comfortable with the partial partial X notation. So to frustrate you, I'm going to switch over to the big U notation. That was, that was a joke. But my notes start to follow O'Neill more so, so I'm going to try to do so as much. So like U1, is partial partial x at p in this context. U2 is partial partial y at p. U3 is partial partial z at p. Or sometimes I use partial partial x1, partial partial x2, partial partial x3, right? So you make up your mind already, fine. Um, so here's, here's a vector. So what is v dot? What's v dot u1? What's v dot u2? What's v dot u3? So by the way, u1 dot u1 is 1. u2 dot u2 is what? Wouldn't what? Mm. Yes, well, um, kind of, but uh, so I'll just um, let me finish writing my litany of fun facts and I'll get back to your question slash comment. So there, there's all your possible dot products. It's commutative, so we don't we have to list the other order, you know? Did I say that? Anyway. Um, so v dot u1 is specifically a u1 plus b u2 plus c u3 dotted with u1, right? And so by properties of the dot product, we distribute. Right? Distribute through, pull out the constants, 
So this with this is zero, this with this is zero. Only u1 with u1 survives. The answer is A. For the first one's A. V dot u2 is B. Because u1 dot u2 is zero and u3 dot u2 is zero. u2 dot u2 is one. So this gives me B. And, and this is C. So this leads us to a observation, which will soon become a theorem. But here's our observation for the standard basis. We have V is equal to V dot U1, U1 plus V dot U2, U2 plus V dot U3, U3. This is very cool. This means we can select components of vectors using dot products. And this is also true if you have another, um, where did I put my notes? Ah. This is still true if we're not looking at, say, the, um, the standard uh, basis, but if we're looking at another basis which is orthonormal. So like theorem, if E1, E2, E3 is orthonormal basis um, for TP, um, R3, then V in TPR3 can be expressed as V equals to the sum I equals 1 to 3 of V dot E sub I times E sub I. So let's prove it. So let V equal to the sum over, um, uh, you know, let's see, it's the sum of what? VI, V upper I, U lower I, right? That's true, right? We can write a vector as a sum of the standard basis. That much is not up for, I mean, there no, 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 shouldn't be any argument there. Then, of course, by our observation, that is just V um, dot uh, ui times ui, right? And this is a sum over i. But the thing is, I could also write this as the sum over i of v dot ui, right, times the sum over j of um, Oh, I'm sorry. I think I'm going to go in a vicious circle here if I'm not careful. Let me 
you know, sometimes you got to know when to when to stop what you're doing and start again. I feel like I'm I'm right there. Let me just check my. Oh. Oh, 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 I'm an idiot. I'm sorry, guys. I was getting ahead of myself. I'm thinking of a different proof. This one's easier. So the first thing is, essentially, the, the proof is essentially just what we exact, exactly what we just did with the standard basis. So if this is an orth orthonormal basis, then that means, among other things, that we can write V any V as a sum of, let's say, some constants. Let's say C sub, I'll, I'll say C sub I, E sub I for the sake, just to give us a, a transitional notation for this proof, I equals 1 to 3. Right? Um, oh, something I neglected to say, but I really should have, is orthonormal set of vectors, there's a really nice simple formula for that. So what this means, if you have S is equal to like V1, V2, da da da, however many you like, VK, then orthonormal, orthonormal means that VI dot VJ is Kronecker delta ij, which is 1 if i is equal to j, and it's 0 if i is not equal to j. So like that, that's my go-to way of thinking of orthonormal. Orthonormal in Rn means that if I list the number, if I list the vectors as 1 through whatever, the dot product is either 0 if they're not the same, or it's 1 if they're the same. The reason it's 1 if they're the same is the dot product of a vector with itself is the length squared. So if they all have length 1, their dot product with themselves must be 1. All right? I, I need that here because when I take V and I dot product with, let's say, Ej, I have this sum, I equals 1 to 3, Ci, Ei, dotted with Ej, right? Then by properties of the dot product, I can pull out I can pull out, pull out the sum as well as the constants, right, by properties of the dot product. Um, I can rewrite this as the sum i equals 1 to 3 of ci ei dot ej. But I assumed what? I assumed that E1, E2, E3 is an orthonormal basis. All right? It's an orthonormal basis. And that means that this is the sum i equals 1 to 3 of ci Kronecker delta ij. What does a Kronecker delta do to a finite sum? This has got three things. Let me write out all three terms in the sum, and you, you tell me what happens here. So we've got C1 delta 1j plus C2 delta 2j plus C3 delta 3j. So you, you, you tell me what happens. If j is equal to 1, what do you get? Yeah, if j is equal to 1, what is that? Yeah, the last two terms are gone because delta 2, 1 and delta, uh, delta 3, 1 are 0. Delta 1, 1 is 1. So we get C1. If j equals to 2, what happens? First and last are 0, we get C2. If j equals to 3, 
the first one, first two are zero, the last one is all that's there. So in short, in all cases, it's CJ. So the Kronecker delta is like the natural enemy of the finite sum. It'll, it'll kill a finite sum. See how that worked? Like if you have a Kronecker delta summed against a finite sum, what you can do is simply set the index of summation equal to whatever else is in the Kronecker delta, in this case, J. So, and that's exactly what we wanted to prove. See, that shows that the Jth component with respect to the E basis is exactly V dot EJ. The theorem follows. In other words, there's nothing particularly special about the standard basis. Any orthonormal basis has this same wonderful property that we can select components by taking dot products. I'm making a big deal about this because we're going to be using that exact property as a linchpin for arguments we're making going forward. Like it's, it's central, this idea. Now we can do more. Like, okay, great. So, um, by the way, of course, um, being that you have just gotten used to the term orthonormal basis, I now feel the name to need to change the name to something else um, since you are starting to feel comfortable with that term, but also because your book uses a different term. This is sort of more general linear algebra speak. We use this orthonormal basis term. In this course, when we have a um, orthonormal set of vectors that we attach at multiple points, all right, so it's, it, it, it's, it's known as a, well, <clears throat> I should say it this way, if, oh man, what, if we select, oh man, what is up with that marker? If we select an orthonormal basis for each P in, in let's say some set M, then um, something like that, E1, E2, E3, is a frame on M. So you could also refer to this orthonormal basis as a frame, or to be more specific, to be more complete in your description, orthonormal frame. But um, O'Neill almost never says orthonormal frame, he just says frame. But all of the frames that he looks at in the whole text, they're all orthonormal frames. So if we have an orthonormal frame, which is just another way of saying an orthonormal basis for a tangent space, um, I guess it's a little bit more than that, right? Because once you start talking about a, an orthonormal frame, maybe you're not thinking about just one point. You're thinking about having an uh, orthonormal basis to attach to different points in your space at different tangent spaces, right? More than one tangent space. So a frame is more like a vector field. Let's say it this way. A frame is to an orthonormal basis, right? An orthonormal frame is to a orthonormal basis as a vector field is to a vector at a point. So a frame is like a set of vector fields that point-wise satisfy the orthonormality condition. <clears throat> Good news, with respect to um, an orthonormal frame, dot products and cross products work like we've already talked. So um, like if you have a proposition here, If uh, E1, E2, E3 is frame, um, and X is equal to, say, A1, E1, e, oops, E lower 1, plus A2, E lower 2, plus A3, E lower 3, and Y is equal to, say, B1, E1, plus B2, E lower 2, plus B3, 
kilo or three, then guess what? X dot Y is nothing more than A1, B1 plus A2, B2 plus A3, B3. Moreover, if E1 cross E2 is equal to E3, if we have met that condition, then guess what? X cross Y is equal to, well, all right, now I'm going to have to think a little bit here. And you guys know the pattern because you did it today. Right? <laughs> you guys will help me, fill, you'll help me fill in the numbers here in a minute, right? How's it go? So 1 goes from 2, 3. This comes from 3, 1. This one comes from 1, 2. And then I do opposite with the minus. But civilized people instead just write the sum. <laughs> over ijk of epsilon ijk, um, a upper i, b upper j, ek, because that formula is much easier to write than all of that. But the point is, dot products and cross products in an orthonormal frame, guess what? Work just the same as usual as long as you keep track of the orthonormal frame components as opposed to the standard components, right? Now the proof of this proposition is the one I was mistakenly starting into about 15 minutes ago or so. All right, so let's see, let's see if we can do this proof. So x dot y equals what? I say, okay, so I can expand that in a sum over i of a i e i dot product with a sum over j of b upper j e upper j that was given in the theorem right now by properties of finite sums and properties of dot product I can rewrite this as the sum over i and j um, a upper i um, Fine, I'll write two sums. I'm not, it's not so much work. All right, sum over i, sum over j, a upper i, b upper j, and then we've got ei dot ej. But what did we assume about this frame? It's an orthonormal frame, right? And so this is Kronecker delta ij, right? And what did we just learn about Kronecker delta ij? It is the natural enemy of the finite sum. Kills it. And um, sorry to be so violent, but so we can replace this sum over j, right? With setting j equal to i. So this is literally the sum over i of ai bi. 
the sum over j vanishes in the, you know, finishing blow of the Kronecker delta. What is that? Oh, that was the claim of the theorem, right? That that's the formula for the dot product. So there you go. Now, the proof for the cross product, of course, is a little bit more sticky. Um, um, here it is, x cross y, again, sum over ai ei crossed with sum over j of bj ej. So I can pull the sums out. And I've got ai, I've got bj, right? And then I've got ei cross ej. I show in the notes, and you can read, I won't take class time on this, but you can prove, not that hard, to prove that if E1 cross E2 is E3, this implies that E2 cross E3 is E1. And it also implies that E3 cross E1 is E2. So if you set up the cross product in the right way, that's a pun, um, on 1 and 2, the other two pairs automatically follow in step. All three of these, you can elegantly and compactly say as follows. E i cross E j is equal to epsilon i j k E k. That identity is true for all j, i j and k. I think I need a sum over k. So like epsilon one, two, three is one. But if you put one, two in the first spot, the only way you can get the last one to give a non-zero thing is if you put three there. So that that encodes E1 cross E2 is E3. Uh, yeah, yeah. But well, eh, but which products don't get you back where you started. Like cross product of vectors is a vector. Um, the wedge product is like that in the following sense. Like if I have dxi wedge dxj wedge dxk, it is equal to epsilon i j k dx1 wedge dx2 wedge dx3. That is the sense in which the epsilon symbol enters into the discussion of wedge products. It captures the, it captures the asymmetry of the wedge product in that way. But so all I'm getting at here, guys, is that this we can replace with that. Which means we can pull the sum over k out, or just write i, j, k, epsilon i, j, k, a, i, b, j, e, k, bam, that's it. That's this formula. But it is important that E1 cross E2 is E3. If that was not the case, then we wouldn't get a right-hand rule. We might get like a left-hand rule. If E2 cross E1 was minus, was E3, then it would be different. Um, so that, that's important. We make a definition. E1, E2, E3 is right-handed frame if, um, you know, it is orthonormal 
and E1 cross E2 is equal to E3. I've been careful in this last proposition and on this board to not write a point dependence because what I'm saying can be done for not just one point, but a whole collection of points at once. All right? I can have a frame that attaches an orthonormal basis at not one point, not two points, but a whole string of points or a whole, whole space of points. All right? All right, so um, can you guys tell me some examples of frames? Can you tell me some frames for most of R3? So, examples. Oh, you got it? Thanks. I was about to go back there. I knew, I knew what I was doing. <laughs> I really did. Um, how about the standard, like just regular standard basis? This is, an, this is a right-handed frame. So, if we look at like just U1, U2, U3 as ui dot uj is chronic or delta ij and of course u1 cross u3 is u3 right <laughs> u3 let's me u1 cross u2 is u3 this is a a right-handed frame in fact on all of our three right this is a frame on r3 and sometimes people will say positively oriented. That's an, another uh, term people sometimes use to describe right-handedness. Two. So let me work it out for you a little bit. Um, what are, we have x equals to r cosine theta, y equals to r sine theta, z equals to, well, z. These are what? So-called cylindrical coordinates, right? You can define the cylindrical coordinate frame as a corresponding frame that goes with the cylindrical coordinate system. My usual notation for this is gives frame r hat, theta hat, z hat. And um, so, or if you like, you could say, I could call this one E1, I could call this one E2, I could call this one E3. The formulas for these are as follows. E1 is cosine theta, U1 plus sine theta, U2. E2 is minus sine theta, U1 plus cosine theta, U2. And E3 in this case is just, well, e is U3. There are um, various ways of understanding that. Um, one way I have is this, like r hat, you can think of as being the gradient of the r function divided by the magnitude of the gradient of the r function. You can work it out like that. You could just draw a picture and try to visualize like that. Maybe that's not the, maybe that's the best way here. So if we pick a point, like here, 